Thank you so much for joining us today. If this is your first time with us, please let us know that you are watching. Grab your phone and text the word WELCOME to 416-267-1189. We want to know that you are here with us. Small groups will also be continuing during the summer months. Please check in with your small group leaders for any schedule changes. And if you are not currently in a small group or would like to join one, please let us know. Thank you for your ongoing financial support. Highway wouldn't exist without you. Remember that there are a few ways you can continue to give. You can send a check by mail, use the Tithely app, or visit our website and click the Give button on our homepage. We also have a fourth way to give, through e-transfer. If you would like the specifics of this giving option, please email us at highway at highwaygospel.ca. Your continued support is deeply appreciated. In order to keep up to date, please visit us at highwaygospel.ca. There you will find the latest information about small groups, coming online events, and other helpful resources. And be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember, you can grab the digital teaching notes on new version under events. Again, thank you for being with us today. And please, continue to remain safe and healthy. Good morning and welcome to Highway Online. We're so excited that you took some time and you joined us this Sunday morning. Um, if this is your first time, we're sending you an extra special welcome. Um, and we're so happy that you're here and you're joining us this morning. Um, just as you guys are getting ready and you're listening to this, um, just remember there's a chat going right now. Um, and we just encourage you to use that. That tool is there for you to talk to one another, pray for one another, encourage one another. Because um, it's been a while since I'm sure many of you have seen each other. As always, if you need a prayer request, you can send us a direct message right on Facebook. If you're watching from um, our website platform, there's a button at the bottom of your screen and it says live prayer. Just click that and it's going to send a message confidentially and privately to one of our staff members who are waiting to pray with you and encourage you and um, lift you up this morning. Before we get going with the rest of our service, let's just take a moment and pray together. So Lord, we just thank you for today. God, we thank you that we can come, we can gather this way online, and I thank you that you are still speaking to us, even though um, it's different than we're used to, or we're not in the building like we wish we could be. God, I just pray that this morning you would open our ears, that you would fix um, our eyes on you, O oh God, that the sermon and the message today would resonate so deep in our spirits, O oh God, that it would transform us from the inside out. We worship you and we praise you this morning, O oh God. Amen.
Today we conclude our series, James, A Faith That Works. James wrote this letter, which we call the Book of James, but he wrote it as a letter originally to the Jewish believers that had been scattered because of the persecution. As we come to the closing words of this letter, for us that's chapter 5. As we come to look at chapter 5 today, we're going to learn that James challenges us about what it means to live the life of the believer. Our faith is supposed to be much more than a religion. It's about how our faith impacts and changes the way we live. It is, in fact, a faith that works. James wrote to show 
the believers, the areas of their lives where they were struggling in their obedience of living for Jesus. He lovingly yet sternly encourages them to correct their ways of living so that they could be able to do as Jesus had instructed them to do. The other thing that we find in chapter 5 is, is James is reminding us about this hope of Christ, the hope of Christ. How the hope of Christ, which is the promised return, the promise of eternity with God, the promise of uh, eternity after this world, that's the hope of Christ. And James is telling us in this chapter that this idea of the hope of Christ works into every aspect of our everyday lives. That as we live in our day-to-day activities, We should never lose sight of the fact that eternity is just around the corner. Eternity is just ahead for us. And that our lives in this world are lived with the understanding and the idea of eternity ahead. Everything that we do in this life has an eternal consequence. We're going to read James chapter 5 in three main sections today. So we're going to start today with looking at the first six verses, and we're going to look at James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the years of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves on the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So James here is speaking to us. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, an overall idea to each of the, our main passages today. And, and what James is teaching us here is a believer does not misuse their wealth. It seems that, as James is writing, that the rich were oppressing the poor. And James was going to have none of that, especially in the church. The Bible and James, but the Bible teaches us that it's not against us having riches, it's against us misusing our riches. And as James talks about riches, he outlines four sins that were happening in that time because of the misuse of wealth. And so I just want to bring these to your attention, and we find them all through these verses. And the first one he talks about is hoarding. That these people were concerned about the riches of the world. They did not concern Consider the eternal riches that were worth uh, a lot more than the worldly riches. So they had their eyes set only in this world and not in eternity. And so James says, don't hoard what you have for this life, but use what you have for eternal purposes. And then stolen wages. Uh, This is a very specific sin here, but it seems like people were doing the work and not getting their fair wages, their fair pay. And the rich were keeping parts of the wages and making themselves richer richer off other people's work. And then there was extravagant living. James says, uh, reminds us, if you would, that God doesn't say we can't enjoy the blessings of our work, but at the same time we should never lose sight of those who have needs around us. The people that James is writing to had wealth, but they had no desire to help the less fortunate. They had no desire to help the needy and the poor. And the last thing that James uh, refers to here is injustice. The, it seems that the rich were using their influence and their power, their power that came from money, in an abusive way. They were able to use their financial resources to take advantage of a system that was against those who were poor and aided those who were wealthy. And James uses strong language because he, he likens this injustice as to murder. And James is warning us. 
and we're warned here, that we must not use whatever riches that God has given us and provided for us in an unworthy manner. Riches and wealth are not evil. Our chasing after them in ungodly ways is where the sin is. Any unhealthy use of wealth can lead us to sin. And we must remember that everything that we have belongs to God. Everything that we have is, is because of God's mercy and blessings on our lives. Our resources, our talents, our gifts, our time, our energy, our wealth are all to be used in a way that honors God and builds his kingdom. And then James takes us to the next section of this book, of this chapter rather, in verse 7. And we read these words. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See, sorry, I put my page. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. There's that reference to the Lord's coming. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance, and you have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. <clears throat> So James has already told us that a believer does not misuse wealth. And now he's saying to us, a believer is patient. Remember, these believers have been facing persecution. They've been scattered and, and living abroad because of persecution. And James says, be patient. Now, what does he mean? This kind of patience doesn't mean, well, just, you know, just sit idly by, just sit at home, just wait for life to happen, don't do anything, just be patient and let time pass. That's not what he's saying. The patience that James is referring to is a patient that, patience that carries the idea of endurance, of bearing burdens and fighting battles. So it's, it's an active patience, if you would. James tells us we're to do all of this all the days of our lives until Jesus comes. That's the hope of Jesus. James uh, paints three pictures of patience so that we can get a better understanding of patience. He doesn't just tell us what it is. He gives us examples. And the first one he gives us is the example of a farmer. <clears throat> we're all quite familiar in concept what a farmer does. A, a farmer grows crops. And that's a, he's talking about crops here. Uh, there are farmers who, who grow livestock and care for livestock. He's talking about crops. And he says, you know, the farmer has to prepare the soil. He has to take time and prep it. And then the uh, farmer needs to plant seed. And, and then the patience really comes into play because even James says they have to wait on the rain and the sun. He says the autumn and the spring rains, they're the earlier one and the later one of the, of the harvest crops. And what he's telling us is in due course, in due course, in due time, when time has passed, when seed is planted, when it's given time to grow, when the sun comes and, and warms it, when the water comes and, and the rain comes and waters it, in due course, if the farmer is patient, he will reap a harvest. And then he gives us a second picture. It's the picture of the prophets. Remember, James's audience are Jewish believers. They, they were schooled and grew up knowing the history and the times of the prophets. And the prophets of old suffered and, and were mistreated by people, even their own people, even though the prophets had done nothing wrong. And, and we think of prophets that go all the way back even to the time of Moses, that for 40 years Moses led Israel in the desert and for 40 years it seems that all Israel did was grumble and complain. Jeremiah 
If you were with us a while back, we did a series on Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was thrown into the cistern, into the mud, left there to die for no other reason than he spoke the word of God. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den, but he survived because God was with him. And Zechariah was put to death in the temple courts. They were mistreated. And James is reminding us that when we suffer undeservedly, that the prophets stand as a reminder to us that we are not alone. As God was with them, God will be with us. And then James writes about maybe the greatest picture of perseverance in the Old Testament, the story of Job. Job was a devoted and faithful follower of God. He was prosperous and happy with his life and everything was good, but the book of Job tells us that the Lord allowed testing to come Job's way, that Satan thought the only reason Job trusted and believed in God is because God was good to him. And God said, I'll prove it to you that his heart is what searches after me. It's his heart that goes after me. And so uh, God allowed testing to come to Job. And Job lost his family, his children. He lost his wealth. He even lost his health. But Job never lost his faith. James reminds us, he tells us, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We need to learn to walk in patience the same way Job did. We must never lose sight of who God is. Never stop trusting God's love and mercy. And we must know that this life is not our end goal. Our end goal is eternity with God. See, walking in patience is not always easy. In fact, it can be extremely difficult at times, but you must learn patience. It's a fruit of the Spirit. When trials and difficulties come your way, it's easy to question God. It's easy to let doubts rise. It's, it's easy to complain about how God is dealing with you or what God is allowing or not doing for you. But James is telling you, don't do that. Learn to be patient. Lean into God and trust Him above all things. And then James takes us to the last passage of this letter of chapter 5, and it begins in verse 13. And here we find these words. If anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. In this passage that we've read, James is actually going to tell us two more things. Um, but just to recap, remember, he's told us a believer does not misuse wealth. A believer is patient. And for the large portion here from verses 13 to 18, he's telling us that a believer is prayerful. See, the Bible never says being a Christian will lead to an easy life. We're not taught that following Jesus means everything will be easy. See, following Jesus doesn't mean there'll be no hardships, no hard times. Following Jesus is not about having things go easy and well. But the Bible does tell us that when trials do come, it doesn't say they might come, it says when they do come, that we're told how to handle them. And James opens up with some very practical things here. He says, you know, if you've got a, if, if things are going rough, pray, pray. 
pray when things are not going well. Then, then he turns it over and he flips on that side. But, you know, if things are going good, then rejoice. See, often we, we run to God when things aren't going good and, and we're willing to pray when things are hard and we, we need God to come through. But then after God comes through, we sometimes forget to thank God and rejoice for all the good that he brings. So he tells us to pray and to rejoice. And then he says, you know, if you are sick, then call the elders, the leaders of the church, anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. So he's telling us what to do. We are called to pray with and for one another. If you've ever done something against a fellow believer, James says, then talk to them. Confess the wrong, confess the sin, make it right, pray together, and move on. Prayer. And then he throws another example at us. James has done that throughout the book. He doesn't change here. He, he gives us the example of Elijah. You know, sometimes we look at the characters in the Bible, we, we look at their lives, and we look at the great things that they accomplish in faith, and we go, wow. I mean, look at them. I mean, we, we think of Moses, like we mentioned a few minutes ago, like, wow, leading all those people out of slavery in Egypt. And now we come to Elijah, and we think, wow. And he gives us the story of Elijah praying for drought and then praying for rain. And we think to ourselves, well, these guys are just, you know, superhuman Christians. But James brings a very important point to us. He says, Elijah was a man just like us. He's a person just like us. <clears throat> the secret to Elijah wasn't Elijah. The secret to Elijah is God. The secret to Elijah's prayers being answered isn't Elijah's prayers. It's Elijah's God. And Elijah's God is our God. Elijah's God is your God. And you could learn to pray like Elijah prayed. All you need to do is rely on God. Our prayers, your prayers should not just be words. Your prayers should be prayers that are spoken earnestly, honestly from your heart as you seek to know God. And as you get to know God more, you'll be able to to make your prayers be even more effective. And then James gives us one last thing. He tells us in the life of a believer, a believer rescues. What do I mean by that? Thank you for asking. Uh, let, let me unpack that a little bit. James is saying we can get so wrapped up in our own trials that we forget the needs of the lost. We forget the needs of the believers who have strayed away from God, turned their back on God, and gone their own way. And so James is telling us that we, the believers, the followers of Jesus, need to be rescuers. We need to rescue those who have walked away from faith. We need to rescue those who don't know God, those who have not heard the story of faith, have not heard the story of Jesus and the hope of salvation, that we need to be able to go after them and rescue them from eternal hell and bring them into eternal life with God. See, as a follower of Jesus, you are called to rescue people. You need to remember that this world is not the end goal of your life or my life or anybody else's life. That, we, that you need to help people find Jesus so they can spend eternity with God. You need to live as an example of who God is. See, being a rescuer isn't just going out and doing, it's being. That you need to be all that God asks you to be. That you need to be a follower of Jesus and obey what Jesus has said. That you need to do what the Bible teaches us is the way that a believer lives in this life. And we need to go around rescuing people so that they could hear about the love of God and know the love of God in their lives. James is encouraging you to live in the way that he has outlined in his letter. <clears throat> That we need to be doers of what God says. That we need to live out our faith in a way that it's a beacon of hope to people. That we need to be rescuers. 
as James brings his letter to a close, he, he challenges all the Jesus followers to live in practical holiness and to practice spiritual maturity. James is saying to us, as we've looked at chapter 5 today, you are not to misuse your wealth. You are to be patient. You are to be prayerful. And you are to be a rescuer. See, spiritual maturity involves every aspect of your life. As a believer, you should be what God wants you to be. And you should do what God wants you to do. You should say what God wants you to say. And sense what God wants you to sense. You need to share what God wants you to share. Because spiritual maturity involves every aspect of your life. Will you live for Jesus? Will you develop your spiritual faith so that you will have a faith that works? Just before I close, maybe you've been listening to me today or you've been following along for a good chunk of this series. And, and as you've been listening, especially today, uh, talking about what a believer is and how a believer lives, you, you sit there and you say to yourself, I'm not really a believer. I'm not really a follower of Jesus, but I want to be one of these followers. I, I want my life to count for more than just this world, but for eternity. I want to know God and live for Jesus. I want to be a Jesus follower. Well, it's really easy. The Bible tells us that you have to believe in God and you have to believe in who Jesus is, that Jesus came to this world, he lived, he died on a cross, he resurrected, and that you have to put your hope and your faith and your trust in Jesus and who he is and who he claimed to be. And if you do that, if you believe with your heart, and you would say with your mouth, Jesus, I believe you, I want a follower, then you too can become a follower of Jesus. And you can do that right now. Even as we close in prayer, you can simply just utter a prayer in your heart that says, Jesus, I want to know you and I want to follow you. Let's pray together. Father, we just come to you right now and we thank you for this letter that James wrote us that, that our faith is not just a head or heart knowledge, but our faith is a faith that's lived out. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us to be the, be the kind of Jesus follower that you call us to be, that we would put our faith into action, that we would live with eternity in mind and we would help people find and know you. For those maybe who are watching today and saying, Jesus, I want to know you. Father, I ask that you would help them. That you would allow them to become a follower of you and you would help them to live for you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if, if you pray to know Jesus in your heart, you're saying, I, I want to know God more. We want to help you in a relationship with God and with Jesus. And so I'll, pick up your phone, if you would, and text me. Text the word love to 416-267-1189. And then follow the prompts for your name and contact info. And we will be in touch with you as we want to help you as you progress in this relationship and this journey with God, all right? You do that. Now, just before I let you go, uh, let me close off with a couple of quick little reminders for you. Uh, first, I want to thank you for joining us today at Highway Online. And remember, if this is your first time with us or one of your first times and you've never let us know you're there, we want to know you're there. We don't want you to just be lost behind a TV screen or a computer screen somewhere. So you can text me as well. Text the word welcome this time, not love, but welcome to the same number, 416-267-1189 and follow the prompts. Um, or if you're on our live stream platform, just click Connect with us up at the top right corner and uh, fill that out and we will get that um, f information from you and be in touch with you. Um, if you live locally, I want to remind you that we have uh, also begun in-person services back in our building and we're online Sundays at 1030. And if you want to join us, uh, you are more than welcome. This is your invitation to come join us. All we ask is that you 
register your seat because of the COVID protocols right now. We've had to limit seating to 30%. And so everybody can reserve a free seat. Just go to our webpage, highwaygospel.ca, and then click the link that's there. It says register here for on-site services, and that'll walk you through all the protocols if you need to. Uh, one last announcement before I let you go. If you are an official Highway member, we are having our annual business meeting for 2019. Yeah, we're a little late, blame COVID. Uh, we're having it next Sunday morning at noon. Um, so you need to register for that as well if you're a member. You should have received an email from the church or even a phone call. And if you didn't, please reach out uh, uh, so that we make sure that we give you all the information you need. Thank you for joining us today. We will either see you in person or online next Sunday morning at 1030. Have a great week. Be safe and be blessed.